Hello, welcome to the uh, 40th uh, Talk in the No Environmental Leadership Seminar Series, or NELS. Uh, the goal of this seminar is to share examples of NOAA's role and that of federal partners in environmental science by those who lead it and make it happen. I am Hernan Garcia, and I'm your host today. Um, we would like to thank the NOAA Science Council for sponsoring these webinars and the NOAA team who I work with to uh, make this uh, seminars possible. Kathy Poser is in the uh, outreach librarian at the NOAA Central Library with NOAA OAR. Sandra Clark is a business analyst with NOAA Nestis Ospo. And Rob Levy, who is the uh, NOAA Studio Production Manager. Just a quick, uh, quick logistics. Uh, all online attendees are muted. Um, but uh, online attendees may post your questions in the Adobe Connect Q&A at any time, and if time allows, at the end, we will address as many questions as possible. Uh, to access the closed captions, please click on the clo closed caption button at the top of the Adobe Connect screen. And finally, this seminar is being recorded for later viewing. Today's NELS is by Dr. Jeffrey Plumlee. He is the chief scientist of the US Geological Survey. He has a, a long list of accomplices and accomplishments and service to our nation. And as chief scientist, he provides uh, strategic scientific vision and counsel to the director and the USGS executive leadership team. And with that, I will uh, turn it to you, Dr. Pondi. Great, thank you very much, Hernan. And um, thanks to you and uh, Noah for the invitation to speak. I was honored to be asked and I've been looking forward to the presentation. Before I go any farther, I want to acknowledge that USGS has a long-standing history of great partnerships with NOAA and we really value all the science that we exchange and, and the collaborations that we are uh, engaged in both past, present and, and future collaborations as well. Also want to send out a my regards to your chief scientist, Sarah Kapnick, who I see on regular occasions associated with many interagency meetings and, and things like that. So Hernan gave me gave a bit of background about me. I, I am in my 41st year with the USGS, started as a student, spent most of my career as a research scientist, and then in 2016, uh, decided to apply for a senior leadership position with the USGS. I moved from Denver back to Reston, Virginia, our headquarters in 2016, uh, where I was environmental health associate director, and then moved into the chief scientist position in early 2019. So um, the, the title of my presentation is Transdisciplinary USGS Earth System Science to Support National Security. Um, I wanted to uh, give you a little bit of background about what national security means to me. It's it's not just uh, issues that are dealt with behind the uh, secret or classified curtain, but there are a lot of different aspects of Earth system challenges that the US and the world are facing uh, that uh, require science that can actually be done in a non-classified way uh, that will that ultimately could uh, really have an important influence on the security of the, of the nation and security of nations around the world things like climate security, food security, water security, uh, health security, and ultimately all comes down to human security. So with that, I'll plunge in to the talk. So give you a little bit of background for, about the USGS. It's a department within the, it's a bureau within the US Department of Interior. We are around 83 to 8,400 employees strong, around 4,600 or maybe more are scientists. We have a number of different facilities, laboratories across the US. You can see all the dots on the map uh, and in two territories. And we have over 4,300 partner and cooperator entities. Uh, in fiscal year 23, our funding was around 1.5 billion appropriated. Uh, we also get a lot, had a lot of funding from disaster supplemental, bipartisan infrastructure law and, and inflation reduction, reduction act. And we also have a large component reimbursable around 587 million in fiscal year 23. So our science is policy informing, non-regulatory, non-advocacy. 
It's arranged around th uh, five theme-based mission areas. You can see on the slide there, water resources, core science systems, natural hazards, energy and minerals, and ecosystems. Um, apologize for the way the, uh, the images came across. There was a translation issue between uh, Microsoft PowerPoint and uh, Adobe Connect, but uh, anyway, you can see them well enough. Uh, so essentially, our, our science that is in these different mission areas works collectively to tackle some of the key uh, and wicked tough um, challenges facing the nation and, and the world in terms of the earth system and how humans interact with it. Uh, you can see that long description of our mission to monitor, analyze, predict current and evolving dynamics of how we, we interact with, act upon, and are affected by the Earth system. And we try to deliver this information to decision makers um, on the timescales, non-geologic timescales uh, relative, relevant to uh, their, the needs for those decisions. And it's a wide range of decision makers, ranging all the way from Congress, from land managing agencies, other federal agencies, all the way to uh, the, the public as well. And increasingly, uh, we are doing uh, co-production of our science with the communities that need it the, the most. We've had a long-standing uh, effort in that regard, but we are increasing those efforts um, with every year. Basically, it's applied and basic science in the public service co-produced with the communities that need it the most. So in order to tackle some of these wicked, tough uh, challenges that can affect national security uh, and that we are facing um, from the Earth system and how we interact with it, uh, these all require transdisciplinary approach to solve, bringing a wide range of disciplines working together. And this diagram shows uh, is a good example of how we bring diverse expertise across the transdisciplinary divide uh, to our science. Uh, our disciplines are in increasingly, our disciplines are shown in blue, uh, the blue circle uh, across our different mission areas, and you can see all the different uh, hydrology, geology, biology, geophysics, uh, things like ecology, botany, environmental health, and, and also, of course, uh, disciplines like data science, um, expertise in uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, computer science, statistics, soil science. But increasingly, our disciplines are interacting with other external disciplines in the yellow cloud uh, through partnerships. And as shown in green, where the blue and yellow clouds overlap, we also employ relatively small but essential groups of translational disciplines to help us bridge the gap between internal and external expertise. So for example, for many years, a small but growing community of our social scientists provided expertise, have been providing expertise on economics, risk communication, and structured decision-making, which are all absolutely vital to our open science. We also want to acknowledge, as I stated earlier, the importance of evolving external partners in co-production of our science particularly from the communities that nurse science the most, such as indigenous, tribal, and disproportionately affected and vulnerable communities. And you'll see the incorporation of indigenous and historical community knowledge in our science is increasingly a key component of this. And um, in terms of national security, it's not only um, issues in the earth system that affect the nation uh, physically with inside our, our borders, but also around the world. So we have an international science component, even though most of our funding is primarily appropriated and focused internally to the US. Some of our international activities include um, development of global data sets, monitoring analysis capabilities. We also apply the science that we've done within the US to elsewhere around the globe. And what we found is that these international research partnerships really help us understand how humans affect and are affected by the Earth system. A big part of that is capacity sharing with other uh, other countries and communities around the world. And what we've always found, and I know this is the same for folks in NOAA that have worked internationally, the lessons we learned abroad really help improve our science at home. So um, USGS does a lot of different things, and uh, I could go on for hours and hours if I gave you examples of everything that we've done or that we are doing across the Earth system continuum. So what I thought I would do over the next uh, 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes, 
is to throw out some uh, sort of a, a sampler of, of all the different types of problems we work on. It's actually a subset, a small subset. Um, but um, that way I can give you some examples. Also, one of the things that I've done, as you see on this slide, I've tried to include QR codes for those who are interested where you can actually get um, better links. Um, and uh, just use your iPhone to, uh, to grab that or your, your mobile phone to grab those QR codes and they'll take you to the links. So starting, starting with this whirlwind tour, uh, I think USGS is perhaps best known for our work on natural hazards such as earthquakes. So we have this global earthquake information and notification service which provides really rapid notification of earthquakes as they happen around the globe. You can see um, in the right the uh, 7.6 magnitude earthquake. We also do a pager damage loss fatality estimate. We also do shake maps, things like that. And this information is turned around very quickly within uh, minutes after an earthquake comes. Um, those living in the DC region probably uh, saw that for the uh, recent fairly low uh, magnitude earthquake that affected uh, New Jersey, Philadelphia, uh, things like that, uh, areas like that. We also, um, our earthquake hazards folks also, um, how this plays directly into national security is we do this national seismic hazard map, model and map, which uh, is used in the establishment of building codes that help make populations safer. We also are well known for uh, our work on volcanic hazards, landslide hazards, and uh, we, we partner with USAID on global disaster assistance. Uh, the Volcano Disaster Assistance Program, you see in the upper left, we've responded to a number of different volcanic eruptions. Uh, the Earthquake Disaster Assistance Team is, is providing input on a number of earthquakes as they happen. And the Landslide Disaster Assistance Team also provides input uh, both before and after landslide disasters around the world. So moving on, one of the key ways that we work internationally is through Landsat, which is a satellite platform, of course, folks hopefully know about, uh, that's been up continuously, uh, providing a continuous record for the last 52 years of the Earth's surface, looking at landscape change. Uh, it's in partnership with NASA. We can do things like look at algal blooms, urban heat maps, irrigated farmlands, tropical forest loss, disasters. And this has been essential. We've had, we're up to Landsat 9 now, and we're working on Landsat Next, which will uh, provide the next level of, of increasing capabilities and technology uh, that should go up in, in another, uh, I think, probably eight or nine years, or maybe, maybe shorter. <laughs> I don't know the exact number. So Landsat um, has allowed us to do a lot of things. And one of the things we participate in with USAID is this FuseNet or Early Warning Explorer tool, um, which allows uh, looking at trends in recent precipitation around the world or within, uh, within uh, different regions of the world. So this provides an early indication of where precipitation has been lacking and there or maybe leading to problems with agricultural production, for example, or water availability. We also use Landsat and other global satellite coverages to do things like global cropland mapping for food and water security. A number of agencies have, or several agencies have capabilities that are along these lines, uh, but this is a global croplands map that you can see um, here showing where all the different croplands are and and are they forest or, or grassland uh, related? And um, we, as, as hyperspectral remote sensing capabilities move more and more into the satellite realm, we are moving to be able to look at uh, mapping specific types of crops as well. Uh, one of the cool things, this just came out um, in the last few months, um, Georgian at our Earth Resources Observation System uh, Science Center in Sioux Falls, has been doing urban heat island mapping using Landsat surface temperature data. Uh, and again, over the 50 years, you can see here, this is uh, these maps on the left are the DC urban area. Uh, on the left is, and both up and lower, is 1985 compared with uh, 2020 on the right. 
and you can see the amount of heat island effect is at, and the temperature, land surface temperature, has increased substantially over, over the last uh, 35 years. Also, if you look at the plot on the left, George has done the analysis for a number of different urban areas around the U.S., and you can actually see the trend of increasing surface temperature over time uh, as measured through Landsat. Uh, this has very interesting implications because this is done with Landsat. You can take the same thing and look at other places around the world as well, other urban areas. And that ultimately will play a role in things like uh, climate security. So urban heat island effects uh, are a major impact on human health, as folks at, at NOAA that we've worked with um, are, are well aware. Okay, moving towards some of the data sets in different areas of different disciplines we look at. Our USGS water mission area does a lot of work um, in partnership with NOAA. Uh, here are some examples of some of the things we do. The USGS Water Dashboard is essentially a re near real-time uh, information stream of over 8,100 stream gauges. And um, uh, these, for example, are used to develop FEMA floodplain maps and, uh, and help provide an indication of the, the uh, relative amounts of flow that are in areas across the U.S. You can see a picture over on the right of one of our stream gauging areas. Our next generation water observing system is getting ready to, uh, uh, is, is working towards enhancing our different gauges so that they can continue to in include information on things like uh, certain aspects of water quality, near real time sensing of water quality, uh, temperature, things like that as well. So we can use information uh, like the water, National Water Dashboard. Uh, as input for global uh, climate change impacts, modeling vulnerability of watersheds to future extreme events and climate change. Uh, these two examples are work led by um, Olivia Miller in our Utah Water Science Center. Well, on the left, left, she looked at and her colleagues looked at how um, water availability um, might change across the southwestern US under um, Sort of moderate greenhouse gas emissions in twenty in twenty eighty or twenty fifty, excuse me, um, and then under higher greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see, uh, while parts of the West actually under lower greenhouse gas emissions might end up seeing more water. Um, in general, that goes away under higher greenhouse gas concentrations. We can also look at vulnerability of watersheds to ha see how they will respond to base flow. Base flow is what comes from the groundwater system uh, during times of, of low water input for, uh, from precipitation. Uh, this is a map of the upper Colorado River Basin. And what you can see is that under various uh, uh, projected futures, you can see that different parts of the basin, the amount of, of water deficit and, and increased reliance on base flow uh, will be expanding. And one of the things that happens then is that you start seeing groundwater composition playing a more important role in the water quality. So things like geologically sourced arsenic might uh, end up uh, being more important uh, and, and influencing water surface water quality. Uh, one of this paper just came out, and I'm, I'm as a geologist, I'm always very happy to show why geology is the is the literal bedrock of of a lot of hydrology and ecology. Uh, this shows for the Shenandoah River Valley, which you can see in the maps on the far left. Which, uh, the bedrock geology actually plays a very strong control on on brook trout abundance, and this is because it affects. Uh, the chemistry, the pH, uh, the, and, and geologic input uh, from groundwater systems. And, and one of the things that this recent study was able to show was that in, in, in geologically parts of the watershed that are, have so-called siliciclastic rocks that don't have a lot of built-in capacity to neutralize uh, the effects of acid rain, they've actually seen an increase in the abundance of brook trout uh, because of the reductions in, in uh, SO2 uh, emissions from, uh, from electric gener electricity generation. However, what they pro also project, though, is that across other watersheds, there will be a likely decline in brook trout 
uh, abundance due to the uh, changes due to the warming of streams and things like that. And that statement you see on the right, strong effects of bedrock geology on brook trout abundance and trends likely stem from its central role in mediating stream morphology, chemistry, and hydrology. Uh, this was work done with the National Park Service, by the way. So out in the desert southwest, um, our Laura Norman, uh, one of our, our research geologists, geographers, has been doing a lot of work with colleagues in, in tribal nations and, and across uh, with academia to look at how nature-based solutions might help uh, mitigate the impacts of climate change going forward and, and drought. And she's looked at the rebuilding of natural infrastructure and dryland streams by creating artificial beaver dams. And what they, they've been able to show is that these artificial water retention structures actually help retain water. Uh, they help increase the amount of infiltration of, of surface water into the groundwater system. And they actually lead to an increase in the vegetation in the watersheds immediately upstream from the uh, from the retainment structures. So this is a really good example of how science can be used to look at, at uh, mitigating impacts of challenges such as climate change on the Earth's system. And this in turn affects things like resilience to uh, wildlife, biodiversity losses, food insecurity, things like that. Uh, we do a lot of work um, to enhance decision making across the wildland fire cycle uh, during pre fire. Um, see if we can get the arrow to here. Oh, that's interesting. Um, pre fire, we do things like vegetation mapping, uh, fuel structures. Are, are there abundant large trees? What types of trees are they? Uh, during, we can actually help map fire ignitions and plot the growth of active fires and model of fire growth. We also look at things like where are the fires burning? Are they burning on rock types that have natural contaminants like asbestos, naturally occurring asbestos or, or crystalline silica, things like that, that, that might be picked up by the smoke or might be encountered by uh, the firefighters as they're doing fire suppression. Post-fire, we do a lot of work on, on things like um, post-fire debris flows. That's one of our more important activities. And then also what are the, what are contained in the contaminants uh, contained in wildfire ash or, or uh, ash left over from the, uh, uh, from the combustion of, of structures. Uh, and then during recovery, we can look, we can do mapping of vegetation changes. We can provide input on the variations in, in soil chemistry, soil mineralogy that might influence how they make decisions on uh, vegetation re restoration, things like that. post fire to reflow hazards. I mentioned that uh, in a lot of areas, we've got a, a fairly uh, readily quickly turned around uh, map for a given watershed within a, within a burned area that uh, you can actually map what are the likelihood of each of the different sub basins to generate a debris flow. So you can actually see which parts of the burned areas are likely to experience downstream uh, debris flows. Uh, the Montecito um, debris flow following the Thomas fire in 28, uh, 2017, uh, very large debris flows came and, and had a very high impact on, on suburban areas. And so we're now moving, shifting to looking at debris flow runout, being able to predict where the debris flows are actually going to, not only the basins they're likely to generate in, but what sorts of volumes and where might the different volumes go. Uh, a lot of the impact that we saw in the previous slide on, on urban areas or, uh, or suburban areas are areas at the wildland urban interface. Uh, this is a cool study that just came out through a collaboration of the USGS and University of Wisconsin uh, Madison Silvis Lab, where they've done a map of wildland urban interface around the globe. And you can see the, the hotter colors in, in the Marseille fronts example are are urban areas and then transitioning into the cooler colors where you can see the, the um, forest versus grasslands and then areas in yellow which are the uh, uh, are the higher uh, higher interface and mix of, of urban and wildland which is where a lot of the fire destruction happens. Uh, this has very interesting implications for being able to look at 
at potential impacts of wildland fire or fire at the wildland urban interface around the world. Okay, moving into the coastal realm. This is again another area where we have uh, had very strong, long-standing partnerships with NOAA, which we for which we thank you very much. Uh, coast, looking at, for example, storm surge, wave overwash, and inundation impacts on vulnerable coasts. Um, and you can see what we call the Bacon Map. Uh, this is produced Bacon Strip Map on the right, um, which was this was done for an actual storm where we can actually predict the probability of inundation, which is the outer one, probability of wave overwash, and then probability of collision. And we very much make make use of of NOAA models as as we're feeding into that. We've um, we also uh, look at the impacts on vulnerable coasts. Our Cosmos Coastal Storm Modeling System. Um, primarily applied um, on the West Coast, but also increasingly being applied elsewhere, uh, is a, a way to model uh, vulnerabilities of, of coasts to different kinds of, uh, of flooding events related to coastal storms. Uh, we also worked with NOAA on looking at uh, uh, South Pacific Islands like Kwajalein Atoll. With uh, this was a project that was that you see on the right was done. Uh, with funding from DOD, where they wanted to look at what are the implications of combined sea level rise with wave overwash events. And what this showed was that likely by 2060, wave overwash events will be uh, on an annual basis risking very high, with high very probability of poisoning of the freshwater, limited freshwater aquifers on the atolls uh, by, uh, by um, Salt water. Um, but also, um, the good news is that there are ways to help reduce the impacts. Coral reef restoration, this is again a project where we've been uh, long standing partners with NOAA and other entities that you see here, are uh, where you can do uh, green restoration, where it's basically try looking at regrowing corals, and then gray green, where you're trying to get the corals to uh, take root on, on concrete structures. Uh, the picture on the right is a study that came out recently that shows that that reef restoration can really improve the improve the ability of the reef crest habitats to keep pace with future sea level rise. Impacts of rapid cryosphere thaw. Uh, we have work going on in Alaska uh, at looking at coastal erosion, biological and hydrologic risks from sea ice loss and permafrost thaw. Uh, we're looking at methane release from thawing permafrost. Uh, this case in the center, we're able to um, use, trying to get the cursor here, yep. Uh, we're using a simple uh, methane, uh, an industrial methane detector attached to an uncrewed aerial dr a drone here, uh, measuring spikes of uh, methane release coming from uh, river channels and meltwater paths in uh, and the thawing permafrost. And that, of course, is a feedback uh, generating more methane, produces more uh, greenhouse gas, etc. And then on the far right, we're looking at the risk of catastrophic landslides and tsunamis at the terminus of the retreating Berry Glacier, uh, where you can see 2010 up to uh, um, 2020, a lot of loss. And this is a, a massive landslide that is, is slowly being destabilized um, because of the uh, uh, loss of the of the glacier that is essentially abutting it and hold it, was abutting it and holding it back, so that we're working with in concert with the state and others. Uh, sea ice loss has interesting implications for polar bear habitat. Uh, Karen Road and our Alaska Science Center has been looking at implications of sea ice loss in the Bering Sea. Uh, that's leading to things like increased summer land use, more land-based denning, exhaustion following long distance swims between ice flows, increased bear human conflicts. And this is a perfect example of where Karen and colleagues worked in partnership with the native corporations to look at how they can bring indigenous knowledge on all of these different aspects of, of polar bear activities uh, to, uh, to provide information that could inform the study. 
Okay, we can, uh, I mentioned nature-based solutions to help mitigate climate change uh, or the impacts of climate change. Here, we're actually looking at how we can mitigate climate change through geologic on the upper left, uh, biologic on the upper right, and then blue carbon or in the coastal marine estuarine environment along the bottom. Uh, geologic carbon uh, sequestration, there are different parts of the US that are more are favorable for storage of larger volumes of carbon dioxide uh, sequestered from uh, power generation or other sources. Uh, the biologic carbon sequestration, this study on the upper right, shows that um, if there's burning, large-scale burning of sagebrush step uh, areas in the Great Basin, that then leads to increased invasive species such as cheatgrass, which have less starving carbon storage capability and also uh, have different burning characteristics. So how can we um, look at, and they've been able to show how reseeding with native perennials, adjusting the land use to decrease the susceptibility of post-burn sage areas, herbicides, and then trying to restore the original sagebrush biome is important. The bottom shows how we can restore flow to uh, marshlands along the coast, uh, and that actually really helps enhance the uh, carbon storage or the blue carbon storage in those marshlands. Uh, we do a lot of work on mineral resources, science to inform the transition to low carbon energy. Uh, uh, we have developed a fo solar vo photovoltaic database. We can use that and a wind uh, farm database to help look at how our uh, various um, biological species of interest affected by alternative energy storage, uh, for example, such as uh, red-tailed hawks or pronghorn antelope, what happens to them as they migrate? Are they changing their migration habits? And this last, over on the right is a, is a really interesting study that was truly transdisciplinary. It was trans-species where we were working with a group uh, that rescues dogs and uh, uses them to sniff out bird carcasses. And we were able to use this to really increase the robustness of our statistical understanding of, of the size of wind turbines and how that affects how many birds might come into contact and, and expire. Uh, we do a lot of uh, al alternative sources of energy and energy storage. Uh, there are a lot of ways with increasing renewable energy like solar, and wind, you need to be able to store the energy. So how can you store uh, compressed air and underground aquifers? How can you store methane uh, for use at other times? Uh, we look at urban geothermal uh, to look at how, uh, what are sources of, of being able to warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Uh, that's a very big effort that a lot of different agencies have going on, but we've been able to work on it as well. And then finally, this is a really cool one in emerging where we're looking at geologic hydrogen. Uh, geologic hydrogen is formed by the interactions of water at, at depth with ferrous iron rich rocks. And that actually then produces hydrogen that uh, you can actually, in some cases, has been noted to be uh, reaching the surface in, in natural seeps. And so are there ways that we can actually promote those kinds of actions to, um, to, be, able to, um, to be able to use um, geologically sourced hydrogen as a new uh, lower impact energy source and would, that wouldn't uh, lead to generation of any CO2 through the production of it or consumption of energy and the production of it. Or it. So, um, Things like all of our different alternative energy sources come, don't come uh, without uh, requiring access to a variety of, of critical minerals, infrastructure minerals, essential minerals. Um, and our National Minerals Information Center actually was the group that developed for the US the critical mineral list. Uh, this, as you see in the upper left, those critical mineral resources are those that are vital to the U.S. economy and national security, but have a supply chain that is vulnerable to disruption, meaning uh, if it comes from other countries, something might happen politically or with a disaster that might disrupt our supply and access to that. And they also have to serve an essential function in the manufacturing or, of a product. So, for example, batteries require cobalt, graphite, lithium, manganese. And these minerals occur in the earth 
at specific geologic places, the geology dictates where they occur. So they may occur in some countries and not others. So one of the things we're looking at is where in the US can we actually um, produce these? Um, where do they have higher occurrence of, of a higher probability of occurrence in the US so that they could be extracted here? Um, and this is a map that is produced by the next thing that I'll talk about, our Earth Resources Mapping Initiative uh, to, uh, to help understand our, our geologic subsurface and critical mineral endowment. So this Earth Resources, Earth Mapping Resources Initiative, or Earth MRI, was instituted a few years ago and was greatly boosted by funding from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. And it's an effort working with the states to modernize our understanding of the nation's subsurface and surface geology and topography and its implications for critical mineral, energy, groundwater resources, and natural hazards. So we're collecting new data on geology, geophysics, geochemistry, mineral deposit databases, core holes, uh, things like, and topography as well. So one of the things that has been looked at and proposed can historical mine sites and mine wastes serve as sources of critical minerals. You see the picture of the abandoned mine on the left, that deep red color is a very acidic water that has very high levels of cobalt, nickel, rare earth elements, things like that. And those are also trapped, although in less easily extracted form in the, in the mine wastes. And we've done this map of, of all the different mine structures around the US as a function of time that will help feed in and inform activities to look at that. And, and what we're hoping is that, that if you're looking at extracting rare earths and other critical minerals from the mine drainage and the mine wastes, that actually will provide a way to offset and clean up the environmental concerns because in particular acid rock drainage and, and some metal rich near neutral mine drainage can have very significant impacts on downstream aquatic ecosystems. Um, and just a couple of more uh, examples here. Uh, we also have quite a bit of work through our environmental health programs looking at contaminants and pathogens in various parts of the environment and what humans are exposed to. And one of the niches that the USGS found is that Nobody really, none of the agencies really has a, a mandate to look at what's coming out of the tap at, at, in your kitchen. And so we've been doing a, a nationwide tap water study looking at a whole range of different organic chemicals, things like PFAS, cyanotoxins, pharmaceuticals, inorganic chemicals like major ions and trace elements like arsenic, microorganisms, uh, things like that. And one of the ways we've been doing that, uh, we have a project working in, in full uh, partnership with Northern Plains uh, Native Nations, uh, including three different, or working with their Strong Heart Water Study, Tribal Corporations, Indian Health Service. And they're looking at tap water in a number of different uh, residential uh, private well water sources and a few municipal water sources. And one of the key things they found is that the where there are really concerns exceeding maximum contaminant levels uh, were in areas that had high geologically sourced arsenic and uranium. And, uh, and so we, are, uh, we also found that a number of the municipal, plot, municipal supplies have levels of contaminants, but they're not necessarily at the levels uh, that would kick in health, health effects, but they should be looked at. Um, then finally, we look at wildlife and zoonotic diseases. Um, we have a, a, a big wildlife health group. Um, avian influenza is one example of you know, the 70 percent of the infectious diseases in humans originate in animals, even though avian influenza is really affecting birds and now we see poultry and, and, and dairy cattle. Um, there's always the concern that it will jump over to humans and become uh, concerned. So the USGS has a lot of work going on there. So essentially birds will pick up uh, avian influenza in China or, or the east. They'll come over via the east or the west uh, through migratory bird pathways, then uh, transmit to um, poultry farms. And as you've seen in the news, uh, dairy farms as well. So, um, and one of the things that our, our work has found is that viruses shed into waters by migrating birds can actually stay uh, infectious for up to a year. 
And so then there's a potential in, in poultry farms that there might be contamination of water supplies that might actually be another exposure pathway. Oh, and sorry, one more that's a, a study that near, near and dear to my heart because I was able to work on it before I moved into senior leadership. Um, our, the tools that we use for earth sciences can actually be used in partnership with our colleagues from the public health. Uh, we were looking with, uh, with partners at the National Jewish Health Center on characterizing the mineral matter types that are present in lung tissue samples. Uh, folks returning from deployment in Iraq and Afghanistan have elevated rates of uh, respiratory disease called deployment-related respiratory disease. So when their lung tissue samples are biopsied, uh, which you see that they're the thing that they look at on the right, which is a thin section transmitted light under the SEM, you can see all sorts of different types of particles. And we can actually quantify different types of particles are they, where are they source from. And what was recently discovered is that there's a very, perhaps not surprisingly, there's a very high level of, uh, there's a, a higher correlation of things like crystalline silica silicates that were inhaled through exposures through dusts uh, that are elevated in the deployers relative to the controls. So the burn pits, uh, people probably have heard about that, may be a source of, of the issue as well, but certainly the geologic components of dust were, were also a big, uh, might be something to look at as well. So with that, I took longer than my promised 35 minutes, but uh, hopefully we'll have 10 minutes for questions. Uh, and the broad reach of our transdisciplinary science plays a role in, in all sorts of things relative to uh, decision making about the challenges, wicked tough challenges that we are faced in the earth human system. So with that, open up for questions. Thank you so much. Um, if in the audience there are questions, you can place them in the Q&A box. I need to put my camera on. Uh, you can put them in the Q and A box, and we'll address them address them in the order that um, we receive them. Uh, meanwhile, we have some some questions for you. Uh, how does your agency integrate the chief scientist role into the science mission decision making process? And what are you most excited about currently? <laughs> That's a great question. So. Um... My view, and, and uh, I'm actually, the, the role that I have right now in this particular position is the first time in a long time, if not forever, that the USGS has had a position like this. And having spent my uh, entire career with the USGS working on transdisciplinary science that crosses all these different boundaries, one of the things that I always thought was that the USGS leadership really could use a whole of USGS perspective on the kinds of science we do. And because I've worked across all the different uh, mission areas, I've worked with really exceptional colleagues from across the USGS and all the different disciplines and with a lot of different colleagues like in the public health uh, realm, engineering, um, disaster response, things like that. The, th the thing that I think we always needed, and I appreciate now that we have this position, is somebody that can look across the whole of USGS and look out for opportunities, try to help facilitate, make connections between scientists. That's one of the things that we've got so many different places that we're located and so many different people working on topics that how can we make better connections and figure out how we can bring the right expertise to bear on a topic on one of these wicked tough challenges uh, regardless of, of where they reside physically across the U.S. and where they reside programmatically or, or organizationally. So that to me is the, is the cool part. And for me, the really fun thing is that I, I get to every day as a new learning lesson about yet another really cool thing the USGS does uh, scientifically, yet another interesting problem that I didn't know we were tackling. And one of the other aspects of my job is to try to en help enhance and represent the whole of USGS science uh, outside on, for example, interagency panels or, or committees or things like that. And so it's through those committees that I, I regularly meet Sarah Kapnick, your chief scientist, and, and uh, I've, I've worked on, know Julie Tertange, um, who's worked on health aspects of climate change 
Um, so what can I do to actually help raise visibility of what we do so that we can actually increase our uh, collaborations with other agencies? And, uh, and how can I bring that to USGS leadership and USGS staff so that they're aware of, of what we can be doing? And certainly the national security is a very good example of all the different kinds of science that we could collectively be doing, most nearly all of it outside the classified realm that could be used in a global perspective to help increase the security of not only uh, the US, for example, how do we anticipate uh, new infectious diseases coming over um, through um, a migrating species or, or dust storms? Uh, how can we anticipate other things that might be influencing the security of the US here at home or uh, the security of other nations that ultimately translate into impacts on us? Great, thank you so much. Um, I have another question here. Um, how do you see uh, NOAA and U USGS working together and benefiting from each other's expertise and perhaps leveraging resources to address, you know, climate challenges and uh, climate resilience, resilience, for example? Yep, well, I, um, excellent question. And, and I think it's, it's very telling that we we already have a lot of very good collaborations in the and the coastal areas and, and some of the marine areas um also there's a lot going on on uh, integrated hy hydro terrestrial modeling um i'm the principal for the usgs and department of interior on the subcommittee on global change research and that's i'm the co-champion of the uh, interagency water cycle working group and interagent and um, our folks david lesmiths of them and and others have been working with with your folks uh, at, at noaa uh, in particular and nasa to figure out how can we do a, uh, how can we look for opportunities in the integrated hydro terrestrial modeling realm to better produce so say for example an extreme event uh, produces a lot of precipitation in any watershed, any particular watershed across the U.S. How can we translate that into impacts downstream uh, on ecosystems, on on humans, on things like that? And how can we better understand groundwater surface and water interactions? Also, how can we play a role in health, um, looking at, for example, the impacts of uh, climate change on health through things like changes in water availability, water quality, water quantity, uh, or urban heat islands. How can we help mitigate the impacts of ur urban heat islands uh, working with your folks? So there are many different opportunities for us to be working together. And I think I mentioned the coastal realm as well. Uh, what can we be doing to help um, enhance the ability of us to work seamlessly together with different data sets to provide the best real time or near real-time information about both looming um, potential impacts associated with uh, impending storms, or how can we better project out to the future, out to, the future um, uh, to look at long-term impacts. There's also a sweet spot that I was gonna mention that I think NOAA folks are very cognizant of, uh, certainly USGS is, um, in terms of um, a, a key national security question is what are the impacts in the coming months to uh, coming decade that will really be forcing decisions on policies like how do we predict uh, a, a, um, a long-term drought that will affect food security uh, in a particular country that will end up leading to more migration uh, or destabilization of governments or things like that so there's a lot of work that we could be doing in the months to decade time frame and understanding, for example, working USGS, looking at the impacts and the, the hydrologic modeling, the on the ground, surface water, groundwater modeling, working with folks from NOAA Weather Service who can actually help reduce the uncertainties and what, um, what are going to be the anticipated impacts of shorter term, season to season to de 10 decades to 10 years uh, trends in, in weather uh, resulting from short term climate change. Great, thank you so much. Um, 
we, we have here a question. Um, let's see. Yeah, I can see. Does your, agency, does your agency anticipate how climate change will affect the agricultural deals? And do you make any recommendations for preservation of the soil water? Yeah, that's a good question. I think most of our work um, is, I, I think the agricultural yields part is more forced. Uh, USDA, not for service, uh, for services within USDA, but uh, I think that's probably the case. But what we do look at uh, are things like impacts of runoff from agricultural fields and how does that affect water quality downstream? How can farmers help minimize that? Uh, we're also doing remote sensing on, on um, things that, that help under, help uh, the agricultural community understand um, viability of crops and, and crop production changes from year to year, things like that. So um, from that perspective, I think we are providing science that can be used to help do things like minimize runoff of agricultural non-point sources of agricultural chemicals, things like that. Great. Um, we have another part. We have time for a couple more questions at least. Uh, uh, is the minerals a rare earth elements uh, map driving new investments in extraction business, or do the business already have those deposits map, mapped out? What, what is the USGS expecting uh, for uh, updating on these products from customers, I say? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So um, what we are doing is we're providing the basic geologic information, geophysical information, and, uh, and topographic information, geochemical, that can help. Um, so what we do is we identify based on the geologic characteristics of these, what we call geologic terrains. So we essentially, you saw that map way back earlier where there are different colors on the US uh, for different types of, where each of those areas has the potential for an elevated geologic potential or the occurrence of a particular type of uh, critical mineral deposit. So we do not, um, so what those areas show, that's, that's like elephant country, um, but then the industry is the, is the group that would be responsible for going in and looking at where those, uh, where, where do the uh, deposits occur within those overall terrain. And for a lot of the, um, a lot of the deposits that will, that could be mined in the future, um, those are all buried beneath the surface. And so I would say that there's probably a pretty good chance that there are a lot of them that the industry does not already know about. There are some that very clearly industry does. But the other thing that USGS can do is help look at holistically um, what sort of, if those were deposits of a particular type were likely to be mined, what would be the likely mining method used? How much waste would they have to develop? What would they do with the waste? And and what could they then do to pre prevent things like acid rock drainage or destabilization of tailings impoundments uh, during extreme weather events? So those are the kinds of things that we can bring to bear on um, on that potential part of the equation. Also, can we can we look at we can also predict for a given ore deposit type or ore deposit system what are the associate? So for example, certain types of copper deposits are more likely co to contain as trace constituents, critical minerals such as tellurium, which is key for solar energy development, or uh, or indium, or germanium, or gallium, or things like that. So uh, we can also provide indications, not only do they need to be looking for the major elements, but also what are some of the trace elements that they would likely be finding. Great, thank you so much. Well, we have one final question. Um, looking five, 10 years into the future, uh, what is steps is taking the USGS towards a diverse and inclusive senior management and workforce? Yeah, that's a, that's something that is always on our mind. We are looking um, over the years, um, and I've noticed this throughout most of my research career, that um, years of level funding translate into uh, into a net loss of workforce simply because we just can't. Uh, as people retire, it's it's easy to uh, it's easy to translate that money into uh, 
into um, the, our operating expenses. And so not only were, are we in a position where we need to replace key expertise that we've lost over the years, but we're also needing, of course, to look at, at how we enhance um, the new expertise that we'll need on things like AI, AI ML and, and uh, new technologies. What are the new technologies going to be doing that will create new demands for critical minerals or things like that? So, and, and how can we increase that? And what we're seeing is that that also presents us with a very strong opportunity to really um, enhance uh, the diversity of our workforce. And we're very committed to that. Um, there's a lot of things that we're doing in that realm that we always have been doing. Uh, one of the things that we've identified is that, there are a lot that, that there's a lot that the science agencies can be doing to help get students from, um, from various communities underserved communities or not urban communities more involved and interested in science at an early age. So what can we be doing to help and interest young students in getting into STEM careers? What can we do in the way of high school internships? What can we do in the way of college internships? What can we do in the way of postdocs or of, of, of um, internships during college years and then postdocs? and then attracting them to the USGS and other science agencies, but then keeping them instead of losing them um, as uh, over time. So all of those steps are things that the USGS needs to be working on. And I've heard my colleagues from other agencies uh, express the same, express the same needs and interests. And, and increasing work on the social sciences end, I think is a great way to actually help with that as well risk communication and um, surveys and things like that are all things that we need to be doing a much better job on if we are uh, going to be doing science co-production with the communities that need it the most. And as we do that work with the communities that need it the most, that's hopefully going to get their, their um, young folks interested in working uh, with the STEM agencies. Great. Um... Thank you so much, Dr. Plum Lee, for this, uh, for this informative seminar. I know I learned quite a bit. Uh, do you have any uh, final comments that you would like to make? I oh, just appreciate the time. Uh, my, uh, my email is gplumley at usgs.gov. Feel, uh, uh, feel free to email me if you have any questions. And uh, for all the colleagues out at NOAA that I know who, who might be online, um, I'm saying hi and, and respect to you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, the recording will be available um, in a few days. Um, and uh, goodbye. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Bye-bye.